Okay, uh, uh, it is my privilege uh, today to introduce our speaker, George Karnadakis, who is from uh, originally from Crete. Uh, he received his SM and PhD from uh, MIT uh, in 1987, he got his PhD. He was appointed lecturer in the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Subsequently, he joined the Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford, NASA Ames. Uh, he then joined, uh, moved to Princeton University as an assist so assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and as an associate faculty in the program of Applied and Computational Mathematics. Um, he was a visiting professor at Caltech in 1993 uh, in the aeronautics department and joined Brown University as an associate, associate professor of applied uh, mathematics in the Center for uh, Fluid Mechanics in 1994. Um, then after becoming a full professor in 96, he continued to be a visiting professor and senior lecturer of ocean mechanical engineering at MIT. Uh, George is an AAAS fellow uh, nominated to uh, in 2018, a fellow for the Industrial uh, and Applied Mathematics Society in 2010, a fellow uh, of the American Physical Society uh, in 2004, and a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 2003. Um, he is also associate uh, fellow of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, George received the SIAM ACM Prize on Computational Science and Engineering in 2021, the Alexander von Humboldt Award in 2017, uh, the SIAM Ralph E. Kleinman Award in 2015, the J. Tinsley Oden Medal in 2013, and the um, CFD Award uh, by the U.S. Association in Computational Mechanics. Um, his in H index is uh, 115. I, I dare anybody to approach that. And he has been cited over 61,000 times. Well, welcome, George. And uh, George will be speaking today on approximating functions, approximating functions, functionals, and operators with neural networks for diverse applications. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Uh, I, um, I'm first of all, I want to apologize uh, for uh, last time I couldn't make it. Uh, uh, although I promised I would give a talk in the previous semester, so this uh, that's why I wanted to start today with uh, some coffee to make up for uh, uh, for this uh, mishap. But uh, really what I want to uh, convey here is the idea of uh, solving in, uh, in ill-imposed, ill-posed inverse problems, uh, just like this one. So I uh, have lots of friends everywhere, but it was difficult to convince them to do this experiment because it's not a technological experiment, but this company, La Vision, uh, finally did this experiment for me where they had all these cameras they put an espresso coffee um, and they basically constructed a three-dimensional temperature field out of it. Now, that was my challenge, how you take this real data from real data, you infer the velocity three field and the pressure field in, three, in 3D and in space over the espresso cup. And of course, that has never been done before because <laughs> there's no need to do that. But um, anyway, uh, before I... I, I go into, um, into solving some problems and, and telling you about neural networks and how we can approximate uh, um, operators, for example, which, uh, and how, what is pins. I want to preempt some uh, criticism or, or questions that, that usually arise. I gave a hundred talks in the last two years on these uh, things in industry and academia, and they always ask, um, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do machine uh, scientific computing using neural networks. So of course, there's some difficulties there, but there are also some advantages. So if we start uh, with the universal function approximation for just a single layer that was work, theoretical work that was done in the early um, 90s, what we see here is um, we have a single layer. And of course, we can approximate uh, a, a function y, which sort of uh, have the data also here, uh, as a linear combination W are these weights, so this is the, the linear part, and then there's only one hidden layer, so so we pass that hidden layer through this um, nonlinear activation function, uh, and and uh, sigma has to be discriminatory, which basically precludes uh, excludes polynomials from it. But uh, today we use um, hyperbolic tangents, ReLU, and so on. So so you can see here right away that. Um, uh, uh, that, that basically we have a linear combination of some bases. 
Now, of course, this base is, is very shallow, one uh, uh, hidden layer. And uh, today we can do, of course, many deep, uh, many layers. That's what the deep neural networks are. And they say they're more expressive and I will show you an example for that. So in other words, I'm sort of suggesting this. Um, uh, also, let me, let me just say that these spaces that we are, are, are kind of unfamiliar because the set of all functions y does not form a vector space since we, this is a nonlinear uh, function here, the activation, what we call the activation function. So it's not like straightforward to convert these to finite elements, but uh, we'll, we'll see uh, some similarities. Okay, first of all, the adaptive basis viewpoint of a neural network. I don't know if you've seen this before, but it, it is really straightforward for that. For us, we're doing scientific computing. So if you take a deep neural network and you stop here at the last nonlinear layer, then what you basically have as the output is the sum of the linear weights, the weights of this last layer, times this phi basis. And this phi basis was created based on back and forth, back and forth iterations. So you can think of this as a data-driven adaptive basis. And that's what really what this neural network is. So I think having this point of view now, we can relate a lot of stuff and people have shown this theoretically uh, that we can approximate exponentially fast. We can approximate, uh, um, uh, and as we increase the uh, the um, depth, we can be more expre expressive, um, and even for scientific machine learning applications. So I want to to show you here a very simple example that we we cover in uh, undergraduate classes. Uh, so let's say this is uh, a function, of course, it has a singularity in a complex plane like that. So if we do a simple Fourier representation of this, as you increase the number of modes, you get these huge uh, uh, overshoots, undershoots right at the boundaries. OK, so, you, so what, what uh, the, uh, we do usually, we say, OK, uh, do you have another approximation? Yes, the Chebyshev approximation where you, you um, favor the endpoints would give you this uh, approximation. So we know how to do that uh, uh, with spectral methods and, and other methods. But uh, the point is, how about neural network? How about this, this adaptive uh, uh, um, basis that I was telling you? So, so the, here the expressivity of a neural network comes in. So we stay, for, we, as, uh, in this animation, I change the number of neural uh, of layers from two to three to four. And as you can see, for a totally random point selection sampling, I can get really an arbitrary accuracy as I want by doing that. So, so clearly this is something that we can exploit in, uh, in scientific machine learning for our applications. There's also people like Jin Chao Xu and others who have uh, uh, talked about the similarity between finite elements uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and a sort of adaptive basis for finite elements. And in, indeed, if you use a RLU, like a, 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 a RAM function, a ReLU function as an activation function, you can see that the hat function in linear finite elements is exactly, so we have the same space uh, here as you can see, and uh, the ReLU space is the linear finite element space, but it's done automatically ad, uh, in an adaptive fashion. In 2D, the arguments are more technical in multi-D to do that, but uh, Jin Chao Xu has um, a couple of papers that, uh, and in fact, a book, uh, he's writing a book or, all finish his finish his book where he explains all this. So I'm not gonna uh, talk about that. What I want to talk about is is not not the classical approach. So I'm not trying to replace finite elements and and, uh, and well established methods uh, uh, for this type of problem where we know the equations, we have some data for the boundary conditions, we have well posed problems. I, that's not what I'm tackling using these new methods. I'm trying to look at these problems. And for a long time, I've been talking to uh, scientists and engineers and, 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 uh, and uh, practitioners. So I know that most of our problems are like that. We have some physics. Uh, we know advection diffusion. We ne never know reactions in a reactive transport problem, for example. Or even if we know the physics, like in turbulence, we cannot re possibly resolve a high rain or some turbulence like in atmosphere. So we have to close it. So we need data. So that's sort of the data simulation problem. But this is where PINs, physics informed neural network come in and will make this a seamless problem. One statement problem, data simulation now becomes a, not a, a discipline, but a very, very simple exercise. Uh, we also have 
problems like that for very complex systems, uh, for social dynamics, for systems of systems, what people are calling now digital twins. You may not, uh, you, you may not know uh, even the governing equations. Never mind the constitutive equations. So I will uh, talk about Deponet if I have time in the second part of my talk, which is operator regression, learning operators, uh, what they call them, new neural operators, and we are the first to actually uh, dive into that into this field theoretically and computationally. Uh, so let me tell you what the pin is. A pin is a very simple construction. In fact, um, our paper was so sim simple that uh, it was rejected a couple of times before it was, uh, it took two years to finally publish it in, in Journal of Computational Physics. And of course, since then, it's the most downloaded paper uh, in JCP. Uh, and because it's simple, it's simple in the sense that you have a standard neural network, x1, x2 is the input, u1, u2 is the output here. I'm looking at the problem in mechanics, let's say. So if we are just have a lot of data and I stay here on the left side, then this is very simple, intellectually not so interesting. I, I just have a mismatch in my least squares, no uh, error. Uh, in some norm, I can change the norm, but uh, this gives rise to an iterative scheme. Uh, we take, uh, this is my objective function or the loss function. I take derivatives with respect to the weights. There are weights and bias sigma here is the nonlinear activation function. And back and forth, back and forth a million times, you find these weights. It's a very inefficient process, but it works. We know uh, the uh, universal approximation theorem is valid for deep ne neural networks as well. So, so that's what you have. But of course, we know that we don't have a million data point to find um, these unknowns. Instead, we have physics. We have physics, we know that U1 and U2 have to satisfy some equations. The, here are the momentum equations. Let's say we have equilibrium, so F1 should be zero, F2 should be zero. So now we penalize in addition to this term for data, we may have some measurements for the boundary conditions. Then we also have this data, which we can extract by evaluating these residuals of those equations at random points in my domains. How do I build these differential operators? I use automatic differentiation. The same, the same technology that uh, Google uses to, to uh, backpropagate uh, the weights, I use the same one to construct these operators. In other words, I take a derivative of, the, of this neural network. So, so basically what we have here is this extension, the physics extension, and, and I write it as lambda because it could be a parameterized um, Physics, for example, imagine you don't know the constitutive equations here for, for this material. So, so this has the same parameters as, as this part of the network is really the same network because we're simply taking derivatives of the neural network. So this way we remove the tyranny of mesh generation. Those of you who work on applications, you know what that means. We just sprinkling random points we evaluate here and we improvise for the lack of measurements. So I have some measurements but also I can provide a lot of data. We can take a weighted sum of those losses and then we pipe it into a standard optimizer and we are done. It's so simple, basically a code that's 100,000 lines could be now less than 100 lines. Uh, in this example of, of the Berger's equation here, and you see here in TensorFlow, I have one line to define my left part of my network. And then I have like a few more lines to define the, uh, the, the PDE. And then I put them together and I'm done. So a high school student, 10 minutes later, starting from this, this is a space domain, this uh, the time domain. Notice that my data here is this crosses. And on purpose, I have a lot of data on initial conditions, but then my boundary conditions, I have huge gaps. You can see here uh, on the, um, I, I, I totally, I'm totally, I totally miss boundary data here. So if I'm to use a classical scheme, I would not be able to solve this problem because I don't have data from here to there. Okay, now this is not a problem here because we are formulating an optimization problem. And as you can see, as I said, 10 minutes later, we get pretty good solutions, no overshoots, no undershoots. So this is, that's why this is appealing because you can get things done. Sometimes the accuracy is not perfect, but if you have some data inside also the domain, the accuracy and the training will be much faster. So these pins are ideal for hybrid problems. Now, this was sort of the original idea. Since then, there are lots of ideas, not just by my group, but by groups around the world. There are thousands of papers on pins now. And every Friday, I have a seminar here that I host people from around the world who tell me how bad pins are and how 
their version is much, much better than my original idea. And I enjoy that. I used to be upset, but now I enjoy them. So, but this one, this idea here is actually comes from my group, how we can use, remember X and T are never discretized because I don't need to discretize this continuous variables. So here I introduced space-time domain decomposition. So for the same problem, the Berger's equation, I can have this arbitrary domain, let's say domain one, and then the blue C is domain two. And on purpose, I make this uh, the, the shape of a dolphin because no finite element can, one single finite element can do that. Now, the good thing about this is that I can have one domain for the dolphin and one neural network and another neural network for the other part of the domain. So if you have multi-physics, you can assign different parts of the space-time domain uh, uh, at different parts of the uh, 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 of time or space. Not only that, you can do this in parallel, okay? Of course, you need, you need some glue. What is the glue that connects domain one and domain two? Well, we know that we work with the residuals. The residuals are zero. So you have to have continuity at least of the residual. If you want to have continuity of, this, of uh, the flux, that's fine. If you're working with conservation laws and you want the fluxes to be continuous, you can impose that also as a penalty. Now, when is pin better than X-pin or X-pin is better than pin? We have this theoretical paper where we use baron spaces and we have the baron norm Baron norm of this domain, baron norm of those that domain can tell us when to actually, uh, uh, when and how to uh, to do the domain decomposition. And a priori, we also have a posteriori error estimates. But you can see here, there's no sims. It's a seamless integration between those two domains, and also you can have almost uh, 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 perfect parallel speed up. Uh, so this can be scalable. Uh, we have scaled it to 120 no eight nodes. Uh, for bigger problems, we can go to 1,000 nodes, but uh, we don't have the, uh, the facility. Um, one of the uh, early uh, questions was, how do you actually combine all this here? For example, the loss will be the boundary losses. Uh, it will be the initial condition, the, the uh, equation itself, plus data. So uh, we tried different things. What Something that worked and it was proposed, not by me, by, by somebody I call Clever Ulysses. Um, from uh, from Texas a and was that you can also make these weights in front of the losses to be fun to be function of space of and time and actually under the same optimization problem you can find those weights directly from the data so for example I'm looking here at the bad business equation second order equation with fourth order spatial derivative the solutions look pretty ugly like you can see like that so the standard pin would not work here however using this the, the clever Ulysses weights, and you can see how the weights distributed and they in fact change in time, but the weights pretty much follow the physics. So knowing that having that works really well for multi-rate and multi-physics problems. And we have a uh, lot of experience on that. So that problem was solved. We also introduce <clears throat> different activation functions. In fact, uh, the community uses these very simplistic activation functions to represent human neurons, right? That's what the human neurons are, that the, uh, uh, it, it's much more complicated equations uh, than, but, but we pretend that one single um, hyperbolic tangent or a loop would, would do the job. But, but early on we introduced, so this is not just for pins, this is for all neural networks. We introduced adaptive activation functions. In fact, in this paper in neurocomputing, we introduce this Kronecker decomposition, as you can see here, where each neuron can have its own activation function. Not only that, uh, you, you can have, uh, uh, this, this will be changing according to the data. For example, uh, this subclass of activation functions, I call them rowdy, because I take the um, noisy, because I take the, um, let's say the hyperbolic tangent and I add to, some, add to it some sinusoidal components. So omega, the frequency will be unknown, alpha, the amplitude will be unknown. So the data will dictate what is the good activation function. As you can see here, those activations uh, functions could evolve from one layer to the other, and in fact, from one neuron to the other. So there's no need for every neuron to, to behave the same. There's no such a thing. So we're trying to build more biologically plausible uh, ways of, of computing. Now, what we have accomplished, and we have done some theory on it, we have accomplished that this Kronecker, we have theory that shows like this Kronecker uh, neural networks are actually always much faster. The loss is much smaller than feed forward neural network, at least for time zero to T. 
some some initial time. They all, we also proved that uh, the the, uh, the initial decay of the loss is um, is um, uh, exponential, as you can see here in this theorem, with some mild conditions, in fact. Uh, so the analysis for two layers, but one can do recursively the same thing. Not only that, we um, we challenge the big boys in computer science, and just with this construction. We have the state of the art results in um, all sorts of computer science benchmarks, both for training, but also for, for uh, testing. So you can see here uh, familiar NIST and other, other benchmarks at CIFAR 100, which is difficult. The green line is what I show you, both for the training and, and the testing. We beat the state of the art in every one of these neural networks. Of course, for physical problems also, uh, we, are, uh, we are doing much better using this uh, Proud deactivation functions. We have another theorem that shows that with this adaptive activation functions, actually, you never get into a plateau. You always, you, you never get into a bad minimum. You may not get to the global optimum, but you can always avoid bad minima, and that's very important in this business. As I said, this is very simple. So um, uh, high school students got into this. And uh, so here is one of my latest co authors, is Jeremy Yu. He was doing a um, an internship at MIT last summer. This year, I have to say that he's, uh, he was accepted at MIT after he wrote this, <laughs> this paper. But his idea was the following. He said, why don't you, um, since this, this is a loss function, but, and you're trying to pin it down to a few points, the collocation points, but if you, what happens if you penalize also the gradient of the loss function? Actually, I had this idea, which I proposed to him, uh, proposed to one of my students, Lulu, and Lulu was at MIT assistant professor at the time and, and in, in the math department. So he supervised Jeremy. And in fact, that's what he did. He added this term where he can also penalize gradients. And how do you take gradients? Well, you use automatic differentiation again. It's more expensive, we have to admit. But uh, Jeremy was able to, with this G pin, gradient enhanced pin, he was able to get errors like that. Here he's solving a diffusion reaction equation. And, uh, and so you can see, for example, the pin will be like that. The gradient pin will be like that, and also higher derivatives and higher norms behave much better. So you can get much better accuracy with much smaller number of training points. So as I said, everybody can play. It's relatively simple. The code never exceeds 100 lines in TensorFlow or PyTorch. I want to go back to the coffee, and we publish a, a paper in, in, in science on, on what I call hidden fluid mechanics. And and I explain why we call it hidden fluid mechanics has sort of some loose analog with hidden Markov processes. So, so I, I, I like fluid mechanics. And, and uh, since I was a student, I was always looking at the flow around an object. In this particular case, this is a von Karman street. You can see down here. But I said to, I challenged my postdocs, those two who are co-authors in the science paper, I said, what if I give you an arbitrary cutout, a video on an arbitrary domain downstream of the object of the dye visualization. Very common experiments. Could be smoke, it could be dye that you use to visualize things. And you don't know anything else. Can you infer the velocity and the pressure? Of course, you don't know the boundary conditions. You don't know that is what the object and so on. So you can see here what they propose. They propose the dye visualization to obey some a model, pretty good model, a passive scalar. And that's acceptable. The Peclet number is not known, but from the data, we can learn it. We don't have boundary conditions, uh, but they will, uh, they will in they include the model for the incompressible fluid, divergence-free. All that can be easily incorporated into the loss functions, just like I explained to you. And then, uh, sure enough, they can learn the velocity field and they can learn the pressure. And in fact, if they let the die go around the body, they can even find the forces on the body just from flow visualizations. We try to do, do that for medical data, and this is... Uh, uh, a real geometry of an unfortunate patient whose uh, artery, brain artery has this dilation, which is called aneurysm. Okay, so what the doctors see is what you see here on the right is a contrasting agent. They inject some dye into the carotid. It goes into the brain. So basically they see if there is some sort of an anomaly. Of course, there's a huge anomaly, but they have no clue because this is totally qualitative. What we propose to do is to actually construct compute the forces and the pressure on this aneurysmal tissue, on the aneurysmal sac, and therefore we can define, determine when this will rupture. Again, you take the image, the black and white image, you assign to some model, then you couple it to a non-Newtonian fluid, 
and and uh, similar like before you built a pin and uh, sure enough you can actually um, obtain um, uh, very good answers for in 3d now inside uh, uh, inside this um, this aneurysm and I have a video here but I don't have time to, to show you going back to to the um, to to the code oh uh, let's see how we can get out I have a movie here, but I cannot play with the, with the cursor. Uh, the, the coffee I show you, basically, what, what we're given is, is this uh, data at, at different uh, slices. And then we have, um, let me see if I can get rid of my uh, pointer. Uh, okay, that was a bad idea. Uh, Okay, maybe I can do this. Hope you can still see my screen now I can. Okay, so now I can play the movies. Uh, so you can see here, uh, just this is data. Now I can infer the same way I can infer the pressure here. In fact, I can infer the velocity. And this is our latest paper in general fluid mechanics. I don't think anybody else ever, everybody, anybody ever published a paper <laughs> like that. Um, uh, here also I wanted to show you the movie that I had where we show the flow. This is, we learned this from Dai. This is actually done in CFD just for verification. So, so this can do what CFD does and, and in fact more. Um, okay, so the reason these people, uh, the good people of La Vision, this is my collaborator now, Thomas Berg, decided to do this because early in the pandemic, we found this video on YouTube, we, we took it. Uh, he's puffing here without and with and without the mask. And, and they said, maybe, maybe we can simulate this using, using this hidden fluid mechanics. Uh, and you can see here, um, uh, the domains. So yes, indeed, we found the pressure here. It's a pressure puff. And this is a velocity now in a quantified form. So basically, we're going from qualitative videos to quantitative uh, answers. So we could answer some questions, how far these uh, uh, droplets go and so on. Um, the method is agnostic to the application. So I wanted to, I know lots of you are interested in um, in fracture and and uh, composites and so on. So this is an an attempt uh, to find porosity in some materials using these uh, very sparse measurements of displacements only at the um, at the boundaries. So in this so here we use a hyperelastic material, but we have done it for metals. We have done it for seven different cases. As before, the question here is: I have the displacement, but I don't know if there's a hole. Where's the hole? How big it is? So it's an identification of an unknown geometry. And in fact, the inside here, you may have an inclusion. So that's also, we, uh, there's a new paper we have in Science Advances. It will appear in about uh, 10 days. So um, here, very quickly, I start from there. Uh, we use Abacus here to improvise for data. But we start with a, a geometry that we pretend that is in the wrong place here and ends up there to find the correct geometry. If you were to use abacus to solve the inverse problem you will, it will take about a year because you don't know the geometries it's totally unknown geometry and you can see the deformations are huge here so we have a way to find the geometry in fact the geometry is parameterized here as an ellipse but it could be a neural network um, there's uh, a lot of other work we're doing on non-destructive valuation of materials i want to show you uh, a, something from uh, on a surface crack and these are real data from ultrasound with from our collaborators from uh, from Air Force. This was actually a, a um, DARPA hackathon. I was participating in a, in a, a program and there were 12 teams and they told us, look, there is here, there's a crack here and you have this ultrasound data. Can you find the crack without assuming where it is, the orientation, the shape? It turns out that the 11 teams, they said they didn't have enough data. Uh, so I decided to uh, show off and I said, I will use only 10% of the data. I use only 10% of the data, but they also use the physics. And what I did here, actually my collaborator did, my, uh, my, my co-authors, they, they, he put here a speed of sound, which is a, a function, but it's an unknown function. So to that function, so, so we have a neural network like a pin, which will penalize this. On the other hand, I have a, another neural network independent parameters theta, which 
will represent this unknown function. So if I've, uh, since I minimize them together, I can find the theta here, the parameters of this and parameters of this. So I can find actually C of X and Y. And here you see the data on the left, the real data. Here you see the pin data on the right. And up here, you see C as X comma Y, the C X comma Y equals zero. That gives me exactly precisely uh, the contour of the crack only with 10% um, data. Since then, with these good people from the Air Force uh, Division of Materials uh, at um, Wright-Patterson, we have also written recently a paper on microstructure, how you can identify microstructure using this type of techniques. I want to impress you with this method, and I don't believe anybody has ever uh, attempted this. It's like, it's like my coffee example. So there's like a room, and there's 256 drones, which are actually aligned on the wall. And the problem is how you uh, crawl, uh, a, a drone will cr cross from one wall to the opposite without hitting the other 255 drones and do it in the shortest time, okay? The way we formulate this was uh, using a Hamilton-Jacobi equation. That's how we use the pins. But we'll also use a symplectic integration, which is stable in time. It's, a, it's another network we call uh, SIP, SIPnets if you're into Hamiltonian systems. We published this paper, and 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 this took the trajectories and, and make them simpler. In fact, straight lines, and then we could uh, solve this problem in in about an hour. We solve this problem in 512 dimensions, and I challenge everyone, including people like Stan Osher and and uh, Lars, Ruth and others who have uh, been working on these problems to solve this in one hour. Uh, the Navy asked my collaborator Jerome if they could do 22 drones. We did here 256 drones. So anyway, I want to end this part. There's all sorts of flavors of pins, which we're trying to adjust to uh, various issues. There's also variational pins, Petrogalerkin projections, where we use the nonlinear space of, of for a trial space of neural networks, but then we use, we use test functions, which are polynomials, Legendre polynomials, and so on, stochastic PDEs, fractional, and so on. And I already told you about X pins. Uh, there's a library has been downloaded over 200,000 times, both in PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow. Uh, it has a geometry module and so on. So it's, it's a good education tool. And we wrote this uh, tutorial in Siam Reviews to go that explains the library. So, um, so that's on GitHub. Uh, the industry is sort of crazy about it, actually. The, there is um, uh, NVIDIA has a full, uh, they hire one of my postdocs early on and they built a, um, whole program um, uh, and the division, in fact, just looking at pins and now uh, deponents and uh, we're happy about that. Um, I wanted to, to make a point about theory. And as you, some of you have been working on finite elements for a long time and you know, it took many years to establish theory even for linear uh, problems. Here, we wanted to have a head start and, and uh, look at, at some of these problems. As I said, the spaces are a little funny uh, but in this paper here, uh, we tried to prove at least for elliptic and parabolic uh, linear PDEs that, um, that what happens if you don't have boundary conditions, you actually converge. And, and we proved that we converge in the L2 sense. And if we include the boundary conditions, we can Im improve this in H1. We have another paper uh, uh, where we show that both for, for the discrete and here's the number of points of collocation points that we sprinkle randomly into the domain, uh, and also the continuous case, we can derive error estimates uh, a priori and a posteriori, not just in two and three dimensions where we use Bernstein inequalities, but also in high dimensions, if you have parametric PDs, for example, and there we'll use a Radamacher complexity arguments uh, to, uh, to make, uh, to do these proofs. Okay, now I want to take you to the second part uh, and that is um, um, uh, how to um, approximate functionals. Now, my motivation was, I was working on this project at MIT. Uh, you heard before that I, I'm working with ocean engineers and, uh, and actually the Navy, the real Navy. So this is an, a real naval destroyer, DDGX, going out to, uh, uh, to Atlantic Ocean, supposed to be autonomous, no captain, but the, you can see there's like uh, waves, sea state eight waves of 20 meters and so on. Now, if you were to, as you know, autonomy as a, as a, as a, um, 
application has totally failed. Uh, despite what you hear from Elon Musk and so on, nobody uh, can do autonom autonomy because you cannot not just simply um, uh, rely on, uh, on data. So in this particular case, we're trying to do CFD and, and um, one of the patient students at MIT spent a, one week per simulation, one week on a parallel computer, a 300 process to run um, open foam on this simulation. So I was thinking all this data is really lost, but what we really care is this six degrees of freedom of this. Of this uh, can we learn that? In other words, the input will be a stochastic excitation uh, for that C. Uh, that's given by the conditions uh, and car forecast this and broadcast every day. Can then we map that onto the motion without uh, avoiding free surfaces, viscous flows, calculations, and so on. So, but I like theory. I, I like to do theory and say, can, because this is functional, can I approximate a functional with the neural network? And the answer is, in fact, yes. Uh, and this is what I found, uh, what I call the jewel theorem by Chen and Chen from University of Fudan. And you may recall that the Saipengo theorem was 1993, 1996, but this is now universal approximation theory for functionals, which basically says f of u, u is a function, f of u is a functional, can be approximated with a standard neural network, in fact, a single layer, just like as before. If you sample at m points, the function u at the sensors points xj, from a compact set in C. That can be done in one dimensions or in multi dimensions. Now, if you have that, then you can go back and say, do I have to build actually a neural network or, or I can find one? And of course, all these recurrent family of neural networks can do that. Here I used an LSTM and I was able with different stochastic excitations to record the basis. It took three months because the, day, the data uh, generation with all, <laughs> open form was uh, really tedious. Only, only MIT students would have the patience to, to, to do this. And in fact, that's all my collaborators are from MIT. So anyway, just to make a, a long story short, this is one excitation uh, given to rise to the three degrees of freedom motion, the most important ones. This is another one. You can see the response of the vessel is not trivial. Underneath, you can see the CFD, which takes one week for each one of these simulations. But now LSTM took about 0.1 second to do it. So we can do it, we can do it. But I was a little more ambitious. I said, okay, if we can approximate functionals, can we approximate operators? And um, so that was the big question. And of course, if you can do that. You can do black box systems. You can do math, you can solve PDEs, you can solve stochastic PDEs and so on. So here we get some inspiration from the brain. If you don't know anything about uh, human neurons, they look like that. There's basically an input with this uh, dendrite the branches. These are called the branches. These are the synapses down here. This is the soma or the trunk. And this is the axon, which is a conduit that transmits this information to the synapses. And then of course, this will pass information to another neuron and so on. So that's what we built. We built a neural network, which looks like this. For example, here, this will be the input. This will be uh, one of these branches. And then this here is the continuous output space, which is sort of the soma, the trunk. So we call this the branch and we call it the trunk. And the reason uh, we did that is because, so, so let me first say what we're talking about. Here we're talking about going from the standard finite dimensional space mapping to a finite dimensional space, to an infinite dimensional space, to another infinite dimensional space, and of course, in between is an operator, okay? So for my good luck, the same Chen and Chen had proved two years later the universal approximation theorem for operators, which nobody knew about it. So I found this theorem, and basically it says now to approximate a continuous nonlinear operator and nonlinear operator, uh, you basically have to have a construction of this form for a single neural, for a single layer again, not, not deep neural networks, but just a single layer. So you can see here what, what we have. We have, this one is the input, just like for the functional. This is really pretty much the functional, but then it takes a sum over P modes. And these modes are constructed by another neural network, what we call the trunk. Remember uh, here, this was my trunk. 
this is my branch. They work together, this cross product. Uh, and so they're working together. So you can think of this here as a sum of k equals one to p. Of this, I will call this here as an alpha k, some coefficient alpha k. And I will call this the basis, a continuous basis. So I have, remember the adaptive basis view, uh, that, 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 the point, viewpoint that I, I showed you earlier. This is really a basis, and this is like different coefficients that correspond to different inputs. And I can, so, so I need to pull u from a compact space v. Um, so that's for the theory. So this is great, and, and, and we, in fact, we, uh, in this paper, we published Nature Machine Intelligence. We uh, were able to realize this in a construct like that. In other words, we built a feed-forward neural network, which will be the branch, uh, and this could be uh, the trunk. And they work together on P. This is sum over P. The cross product, it gives me the output, which the output is continuous in space. You may have seen other operators, which they don't have a trunk. They use a, like a, Caltech has recently proposed a Fourier neural operator. This is actually a subcase of our, our network because if I take the trunk to be a trigonometric basis, I can easily reproduce their, their operator. But here we have a plurality of operators. The difficulty is that this is a, a, sing, a single hidden layer and that doesn't work very well if you have many dimensions from the practical point of view. So what we did actually in this uh, paper uh, we replaced the single layer with deep neural networks, and, and we had the proof that this is a universal approximation now for deep neural networks. Not only that, we proved that we can beat the curse of dimensionality in the input space. In the input space, this is very, very important. We also show that uh, we converge exponentially fast in the input space. So we can train an operator very fast. Remember here, we just have data. This is supervised learning, okay? so I, so. Uh, I'll show you how this works, but let, let's let's set up the problem. Let's look at uh, panel B. Panel B, I have some function, which is my my excitation, and then I observe the output at a few points. Turns out that that's that's the key point that I don't have to have my output, which is a field, right? It's a field. I don't have to observe it in many points, but I need to have a good characterization of my input. But the input's not a problem. But the output one two points. So if you have do experiments, you only need to, for, for each excitation, a couple of experiments, not the thousands of experiments, because this will be the case of dimensionality. Let me show you an example. This is an example of, um, of, of uh, how this would, would work for, um, let's say, find this operator, the, the antiderivative or the integral operator of zero to x. So the mapping is from u to s of x. S of x is the integral here. x could be from zero to one, could be zero to infinity for Laplace transform. So the way I train this is I take 1,000 functions. I know the integrals, the indefinite integrals to x. And I actually observe this at only one point, at x naught, not at many, many points. And remember, x is this interval. I should have a lot of points, but I only take one point. So after 10,000 points, I get basically my, my depot net knows how to do this integration. You can see the mean square error goes down to zero as I increase the number of iterations. And in fact, here I compare with different architectures, the training and testing the difference, which is called the generalization error is very small. So Deponet has the best generalization error from other available architectures. And the reviewers gave us hard times as, oh, can you beat uh, Google? They have sequence to sequence and so on. And of course we did. Um, I like fractional operators. So I said, oh, maybe, maybe I can teach Deponet uh, fractional calculus. So I, had, I don't have to do this expensive computations, Laplacians and so on. But uh, first let's learn the Caputo derivative here. So the same thing, you, uh, we know the answer, La use label data and use a branch and a, a trunk. So we can now, now uh, Deponet can learn to take this derivative as if you're not familiar, it's a, the Caputo derivative takes the derivative inside the integrals, of course, it's non-local non in time or in space. And that's what this calculus is for. I'm not trying to show off here. I'm trying to show you one more thing. Remember I talked about the space V. Let me go back. The space V, the compact space, that's very important. And in this example, I was taking V to be a Gauss random field, which is not a compact space, but it worked really well. So here, I also need for the training to take 
functions from some space, right? I try Gauss random field and you can see I get a pretty good convergence, training and testing. Then I try to express this using some other like spectral expansions or polyfractonomials or wavelets and so on. And by characterizing the input space better, you can get an order of magnitude gain in accuracy. So the key is really to have a very expressive space for the input where you draw functions from. In other words, the hat where you draw functions from has to be rich enough to gain a good accuracy. So that gives you an idea. We have done this for stochastic PDEs and so on. Let me see how much time I have. So, okay, I have plenty of time. I want to show you a real example uh, in a physical example, how we can grow bubbles. Bubbles which are tiny, if they are tiny, uh, they, can, they have to be modeled by molecular dynamics. If they are large above a micron, they're round and, and they can be modeled by this nice equation by Lord Rayleigh, it's called the rayleigh plesse equation. So the problem we have here is uh, we want to see how they, I, I start with a, some bubble of initial radius zero, R, R zero, and I want to see if I apply some pressure, arbitrary pressure in, in time, how would this bubble grow? This equation is, is very nice, and I'm, I'm not going to use this equation. I'm only going to use de, um, simulated data from this equation to train the network. And basically, I want the network, Deponet, to discover this equation. Okay, And in fact, this is what I'm doing here. I have pairs of pressure difference and the radius, and I pipe that in the trunk. I put the time. So I do that many times, 500 times, 10,000 times. Then I, I discovered this equation. So now if you give me a new bubble, new size, and then a new pressure difference in 0.01 second, I can give you the growth of this. Here's an example. Um, these are some arbitrary, this is unseen data. Data, I didn't use this data to train it. This is new data that you give me. And here you can see the multi-rate response. This is R as a function of time for three different pressure differences. You can see it's pretty uh, multi-rate dynamics. You have the bubbles oscillate, they breathe, and then they decay because here, for example, because of the pressure difference and the viscosity. But the dynamics is not trivial at all, and we are able to capture the dynamics. Of course, LSTM can do that. In fact, here in this paper, we, we, you can see here, uh, for, uh, for this case, using 200 uh, points per trajectory, LSTM is this one, Deponent is this one. They do a pretty good job. Now, what happens if you only have 20 points? Because it's expensive to measure all this stuff. If, uh, if you have only 20 points, you have a, a slow camera, you can see LSTM totally misses the fast dynamics. Deponet can work with only 20 points, okay? So we can see we beat LSTM, which is the golden standard actually in time series forecasting by a factor of 10. And the cost of Deponet is much, much smaller than LSTM because LSTM takes um, long histories and so on. But we're more ambitious. We wanted to, um, uh, to grow bubbles from here all the way to big. Remember, this line is the demarcation line. If you can see my cursor, this is one micron. Uh, this equation is not really valid in, inside here. So we wanted to see if we can also teach Deponet uh, to train it with stochastic data. So molecular dynamics data will look like that. You can see here on the right, the bubbles are not even round. There's lots of noise and so on. And here I show you that indeed, if you feed the deponent with this data, it can learn in this regime. Can it learn in the combined regime? So in other words, can we have a deponent as a seamless multiscale operator? The answer is yes, surprisingly, because that's a discontinuous operator. So, so we feed it with uh, noisy data, from, from uh, MD simulation, we feed it from the continuum simulation. And then we ask the question, if I start with an arbitrary initial radius and anywhere, can I get a correct solution? And the answer is yes, that's our latest paper. So we have the first seamless deponent multi-scale operator, which no matter how difficult the problem is, it forecasts in 0.01 seconds because it doesn't train anymore. If everything is pre-trained and then it just interpolates in the functional space. That's the big idea about Deponet. Um, but as I said, Deponet is not just one network, it's a plurality of networks. For example, if you have imaging data, 
And you can see you can change the FNN with a, 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 a CNN. If you, you can even be smarter in terms of instead of time, you can use some other coordinates. Uh, you can use sines, cosines, you can use PCA, you can use a Koopman operator decomposition here. Uh, anything to bias, inductive biases to make this uh, smarter. Uh, and this is, as I, as I uh, was explained to me by neuroscientists at uh, Brown and also at MIT, this is sort of pretty close to, to uh, without uh, spikes, to biologically plausible uh, uh, neural networks. Um, the latest paper that we have is um, we're trying to use DeepoNet uh, with these uh, autoencoders, as you can see here. And we're doing something that has never been tried before, I think. We have lots of data from our Yale collaborators on mice. And we have five, actually here I show four, but actually we have five different uh, genotypes. And we break this, the aortas of these uh, mice uh, with some experiments. So we have, have stress, stretch, stress, stretch relationships. And we're trying to train a depot net with, an auto, with a, this, uh, this autoencoder actually here. Uh, as an input to the uh, sort of a filter into the branch to see if we can go from phenotype to genotype and from genotype to phenotype. So we were able to get 85% accuracy in detecting from mechanical test, by a mechanical test, what was the genotype of that tissue. Okay, we call that genotype to phenotype net. And so it, it, it tells you like some of the combinations. In terms of the theory, uh, Sid Misser from ETH wrote a paper with his student, a very smart student, 120 pages paper. And uh, he put this in a very solid theoretical background. For example, I'm done. Okay, uh, I'll be done in one minute. Uh, so, so basically, the operator does have to be continuous. And also, the input space doesn't have to be con uh, compact. He also produced some error estimates of it. I'll skip all this stuff. Um, I just want to advertise a course we are, we are developing for NVIDIA. This will be the first course on machine learning without cats and dogs. This is deep learning for scientists and engineers. Uh, we are teaching, here's a course roadmap. We are teaching PyTorch and Python. Everything is on notebooks. Everything will be free for everybody to download in about two months. Uh, we teach uh, everything on neural networks from the approximation point of view, uh, on optimization. Then we go on to pins, to operators, to uncertainty quantification, which I didn't talk about here. And then uh, how you do multi-GPU computing. I know your high-performance computing center there would be probably interested in that. And I think with that, I would like to acknowledge this, uh, my two centers, the films, physics-informed learning machines that I'm directing, and also a, a recent new library Air Force on, on this uh, topic. And with that, I be happy to take questions. I think it only took 50 minutes, but uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. I would like to solicit questions from the audience. While we're waiting, while we're waiting for a question, I had a quick thought, and and uh, and that is, um, since one can do uh, sort of inverse problems, uh, then I guess one could do optimization as well. Yes. Yes. Kinds. Okay. That's right. Yeah, especially for that's a very good point, uh, Robert. Especially for the um, for DeepoNet. DeepoNet is a very good surrogate for yes. uh, optimization. And uh, in fact, the, one of our patents recently is on that, where we optimize a material, cutting different holes and so on, make it uh, uh, find the best. Op so, so optimization. Uh, since you are interested in fracture, I know we also have a a DeepoNet for fracture where we use. Um, uh, in that paper, we use, um, we train it using a phase field, but a variational statement. So we put in the loss function, the variational statement, and mm -hmm. then we start with arbitrary uh, lengths of and different locations of the of the initial crack, and and we and in 0.01 seconds, it's always 0.01 seconds on your laptop, you can see where this goes, nice. where the crack goes. So that that just appeared in SMAMI last week, actually. Computer methods oh. applied mechanics. It's called uh, physics informed variational depot net. Okay, very nice. Yes, yeah. I definitely take a look at that. That's Patrick. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thanks for your really nice talk. So, one question we ask all people we invite is so, 
what could computer scientists learn from yeah, the AI people developing these models like you and vice versa? What could these people learn from computer scientists and high performance computing? Oh, these are two different things because computer scientists never compute. So I don't know if that's uh, that's <laughs> uh, uh, compute from computer science. You mean theoretical computer scientists or or, or people who compute? Also, so computer, computer, people or, or normally you need some GPU support or run large okay, yeah, things yeah, yeah. like this. So. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So so some some of the talks we give actually to IBM and AMD. They gave talks and and this is. Um, the version that I presented, which was the X pin, the domain decomp time, time space the domain decomposition, that is of great interest actually to IBM and they and they are interested in uh, taking this to climate so they can do that so they can uh, have, uh, as I said, we, we did up to 128 nodes and we get pretty good, um, more than 85-90% uh, weak uh, parallel efficiency. Uh, so remember that. Uh, I have the, 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 in this model, you can tune, you can assign in each subdomain in GPU, but more importantly, you can actually change the learning model. Like for example, in what I show you, in one, in one model inside the dolphin, I have a hyperbolic tangent, outside I had a sign for activation function. And then I can have different neurons and so on. Plus, and this is a very big plus, we do, we can do parallel in time, right? This was parallel in time. It's not so easy to do parallel in time. So, so I think those two issues with the XPIN uh, could be very useful for those who do high performance computing. It, if you ask me what the computer science can learn from us is, is that uh, actually they are now embracing this idea of including more physics, right? All the equivariance principles that they're trying to do more physics into neural networks because they can learn much faster. And uh, so even the symmetries, um, but like rotational symmetry, they endow CNN with rotational symmetry. It has translational symmetry, but then, then they see a, a stop sign that is uh, tilted a little bit, they cannot recognize it. So they need, they need uh, uh, symmetries, Galilean invariances, of course they have in CNN, but all, the, all this type of physical constraints that we put in through conservation laws or no conservation laws, could be any prior knowledge. That's what we are sort of pushing from our side. And I think the community has recognized that. Uh, what we can learn from the computer science community, uh, well, I don't know if it's the computer science community, all those people who do optimization, the big bottleneck is optimization. If we learn how to, opt, to, uh, to solve the uh, high dimensional non-convex optimization problem better <laughs> and faster, <laughs> then we are done. But if anybody has solutions on back propagation, which is a big expense right now, the big expense is really back propagation. And there's a huge debate. Uh, I am actually not talking to computer scientists anymore. I'm talking to neuroscientists. This, this morning I had a meeting with neuroscientists because I'm interested to know how the brain back propagates. It doesn't do a global end-to-end uh, -end back propagation that's for sure <laughs> because we only need 20 watts but uh but elon musk needs 20 megawatts for his uh so so there's a one million factor energy inefficiency one million okay so so clearly and that has to do with back propagation no question about it and and the encoding the information with spikes but so yeah i mean I don't know. I, I, you know, I, uh, Rob knows that I solve problems uh, and, I, and I kind of focus on that, but then we carve out some other problems. That... I, yeah, I, I have a question here from Chelling, uh, who he's asking, um, how can we reduce the generalization error to make PIN more compatible with traditional approaches for the approximation of low dimensional PDEs and then also high dimensional PDEs? Those are two oh, no, I, I, look, uh, it's a good question. If you, uh, let's talk about low dimensional PDs. Low dimensional PDs, let's say abacus versus pins forward problem, right? For the, for, the, for the hole that I show you, abacus will do this one minute and the pins will do it in one hour. And that's because of the back propagation. Now, let's look at the inverse problem. Let's look at the inverse problem. Pins will do it in one hour, still in one hour, because the same code, exactly the same complexity, Abacus will do it in, a, in maybe that problem six months. I calculate six months. 
to solve with the same accuracy. So, so, so pins are not designed to, um, to, to compete with spectral methods that I like. I like spectral element methods that I have, because you're never get, gonna get 10, better than 10 to the minus five accuracy because of the ceiling that we have with the optimization. So no matter what you do, the people who do classification is different, right? Because they say, oh, 10% er uh, error is not big enough. It's, it's, it's very, very small for them. We're talking about 10 to the minus five. I can, I can tell you, you cannot go, if you solve, if you solve the, the um, and, and for some Mickey Mouse problems, you can solve uh, the system more accurately and so on. You can go down 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight. But the idea here is not to make pins competitive with, with good methods like finite elements and spectral methods for the forward problem. But if you have noisy data, if you have if you, gaps in boundary conditions, if you don't have boundary conditions, if you have data inside the domain instead of the boundaries, that's where pins is a solution. And I think a unique solution. Now, some people have better versions than mine, as I said, uh, and that's I'm happy to have lots of people who get tenure now based on this. That I'm happy I support them, I write letters for them, no problem. But I'm saying this, the point is not to make, I think that a lot of people do make that mistake. Finite elements are great method. Spectral element method is, is even better, but uh, uh, because of my PhD thesis. So, so but, but, but that's not the point. That's not the point. So I'm not trying to go neck to neck with, but again, in idealized conditions, I will not change the solvers. If you have real world conditions with gappy data, with some noise and so on, pins is, is the solution. Some version of pin, not necessarily mine. I hope I hope I didn't insult anybody, but 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 I, I have strong views about it actually. I uh, here's a question from Manyang Taji. Uh, how does Deep One Net address non-uniqueness in the matter? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, it doesn't address it directly, but the way we, we are doing it is uh, we do like some perturbation. Let's say you learn the mapping, right? Deep Net learns a nonlinear mapping. After you learn the mapping, if you put uh, like 5% or 10% noise on the testing data, you would see how stable you are. And in fact, we did some tests in the paper that we have out on FNO and uh, we put 5%, just an advection equation. Uh, we learn it, then we put 5% noise, actually 1% noise, then the error in FNO was 300%. We stay, uh, for 1% noise, we stay 1% error added. So, so you show, this way you perturb basically, and you want to see if the, the mapping that you learn is stable. There are other ways, the regularizations and so on, but, but basically that's a good test, which uh, we are pursuing now. We don't have theoretical results, but uh, but I think that's a good way of uh, of checking is if that mapping is stable, subjected to noisy data, which they has not seen before. There's a, a another person, Oliver uh, Weger, asks, um, how big are the neural networks and data sets that you are typically using? Um, well, okay, for deep for for for, uh, for pins, it can go from four to five layers to 20 layers. But one thing that, that is important is because we take derivatives of a neural network, let's say if I start with five layers, if I take a derivative, it's automatic differentiation, effectively actually have a 10 layer. So, the, so if you look how the, uh, the uh, uh, automatic differentiation works on the neural network, it expands the neural network. So the complexity, so. So when I so so when I take fourth derivative, I have a very deep network, but uh, but typically as a user, you will start with um, let's say five, four, five uh, uh, layers, a hundred neurons. Deponent similar, we go like two to five layers and probably a hundred neurons. Uh, you can do meta learning, you can do hyperparameter tuning, and people have done that. But uh, uh, usually, when you have depends on the solution if it's. If it's a smooth solution, you can go shallow. If you can, if you have uh, a rough solution, you want to go deep for expressivity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one last question here. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, says, as you just mentioned uh, in pins, you inform the neural networks about physics through constraints. 
what about adding physical in through information through a prior uh, into the model or neural network formulation? Yeah. Uh, excellent question. This is an excellent question. People have done that. My student Paris Pendikaris, who's at UPenn now, has done this. Uh, also Wei Chai uh, at SMU. So, the, so, so, for example, when you're interested in wave propagation, you have huge disparity in frequencies, right? You have you all neural networks, not just pins, suffer from what's called the spectral bias. Spectral bias is just like Fourier method. You learn the low frequencies, and and you have hard time learning the high frequencies. So. What 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 the um, uh, what it was suggested? You can actually put a, a layer uh, in the um, uh, an, an inductive layer as input to the pin, which will be sines of 100 pi x, uh, to, uh, cosines of 200 pi x. In other words, you induce a certain frequency range. Uh, so so basically, you this is a very good suggestion because we're doing it actually in, in practical problems. You have to do that. You have to do like, or if you know exponential um, responses and so on, you put a layer like that, uh, an inductive bias, and that wor works like a charm. Uh, you train much faster. Um, uh, you get very good accuracy solutions and so on. So yes, you can. Th this is actually um, up to the modeler, but uh, there are problems I I, I worked on like um, some uh, real real problems with diabetes. Uh, where you get spikes because somebody eats a tiramisu and so on. And, and, then, this, and then you have oscillations, so spikes and oscillations. You cannot, a, a standard neural network will, will do it or the pin, but you need to be very big. If you do the inductive bias that the question suggests, uh, then with a very shallow network, relatively shallow, you can, you can nail it. So inductive bias is really, really important. I, I mentioned that in the context of deponet, but actually it's important also for pin. And thanks for that question, very good question. Well, thank you, George. It, it, it was a real pleasure uh, having you uh, give a, a great talk and I wish we had a little more time. <laughs> um, I just want to say uh, next month, we March 2nd, we also have a lecture and uh, it'll be Dr. Uh, let's see who this is, Dr. Young Chu Cho, Choi from uh, Illinois. Um, George, thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, Thanks for having me and, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.